Writing unit tests with JUnit can be boring, right? Even for me as a professional developer, I sometimes find it quite tedious. But what if we could find a way to make JUnit testing a craft that you can master and even enjoy? In this video, I will reveal five tips on how to write effective JUnit tests properly. Starting with tip number one, write tests that are focused on one aspect. Write tests that zero in on just one thing. Let's look at a practical example that really drives this point home. Let's say we have a function called calculate discount in our shopping cart application, right? This method finds and returns how much discount can be applied to the items in your shopping cart, for example. And if there is a discount, it auto applies it. As you can see, this has two behaviors. It returns the discounted cost and then it applies the discount if it's available. The wrong way to test this would be to check those multiple behaviors in a single test. Let me show you. I have a test called calculate discount, which initializes the shopping cart, adds an item, calculates the discount and checks if the discount is applied. See what's happening here. We are testing both the discount calculation part and if the discount flag is set. Now imagine this test fails. Now was the calculation wrong or was the flag not set? You wouldn't know. We are setting ourselves up for a mini investigation every time something goes wrong, right? Now let's split this up the right way. We have a test calculate discount returns correct value, which only checks the value value returned by the discount. And then we have another test which checks if the flag is set and it's testing only that. Notice the difference. Each test focuses on one aspect. If test calculate discount returns correct value fails, you know that the issue is with the discount calculation and not in the setting of the flag, right? We've eliminated the guesswork and we've pinpointed exactly where our problem lies. That's the power of focused tests, right? They're like a well-organized tool set. Each tool has its specific use and it makes your job a whole lot easier. You spend less time figuring out what went wrong and you can get right to fixing it, right? So keep your test focused and watch your test failures instantly tell you exactly what went wrong. It's actually perfectly okay and in fact common to have one source method have multiple tests, right? You have to write tests that focus on one aspect each. That's tip number one. Moving to tip number two, consolidate common setup and tear down code. It's all about not repeating yourself. It's a principle that's so commonly stated in the programming world and it's for a good reason. It's very much applicable in testing as well. Because you see, there are always going to be things that you'll have to do that repeats across multiple tests. A classic example for this is any setup and tear down logic. You need to run some code that sets the stage for the tests to run, you know, like prep work, the code needs to run before anything you want to run in the test itself. Similarly, you need code that does cleanup work and that code needs to run after each and every test runs. Now, just because the code needs to run in front of and after every test doesn't mean that the code has to be duplicated in front of and after every test. Here's an example of what not to do. Okay, so here I have a user registration test. I'm doing a database connection and then running the test and I'm disconnecting from the database. I have another test for user login. What am I doing here? Database connection, running the test, and then database disconnection. Notice how both the tests connect to the database before the test code executes and disconnect from the database after the test code is done, right? This is repetitive and error prone. Now, what if you change the database setup process? You'll have to update every single test. It's really inefficient to repeat the same setup and cleanup code in every single test. It clutters your test suite and it makes maintenance a bit of a headache. So you can say, okay, I'm going to move the common code to a setup method and a teardown method. But even if you do that, that leaves you with the responsibility of calling the setup method at the beginning of every test and calling the teardown method at the end of every test, right? Let's do this the right way. Here, what I'm doing is I have a setup database method and I've annotated it with the before each annotation. What am I doing here? Database.connect. I have a teardown database method annotated with after each where I'm doing the database disconnection. And now in my test, I don't do any connection or disconnection, right? I have offloaded that work. I have two tests which don't bother with the setup and teardown. What are we doing here? We are using the JUnit annotations before each and after each. The method annotated with before each is automatically run by JUnit before it runs each test. And the method annotated by after each automatically run by JUnit after each test. So you don't have to write any common logic in each test, right? Not even an invocation to a method that has a common logic. By using before each and after each annotations, we have centralized the setup and teardown logic and there's no remnants of code in each test itself, right? It's more cleaner, more manageable. And if you need to change anything in your setup or teardown logic, even if it is to completely remove it, you just have to do it in one place, right? That is tip number two. Moving on to tip number three, 
keeping our tests independent and repeatable. Think of each test as a standalone story. It shouldn't rely on the plot of another story to make sense, all right? Standalone story, no sequel, no part of a series. Tests need to be able to run without expecting another test to run. We can expect the setup and the teardown we've just discussed, right? That's fair and very valid, but it should not depend on another test itself having run, okay? When the tests depend on each other, it's like building a house of cards, right? If you remove one and the whole structure might collapse, each test should stand on its own unaffected by others. All right, so what's the wrong way to do this? Let's say we have a user registration system and we write our tests like this, right? I have a test user registration, which creates a new user, registers it and verifies if it's successful and have another test that's checking for duplicate user registration. Now I'm going to register the same user again and expect that I get an exception that that user already exists. The first test method tests that the registration itself goes through fine. The second test method checks and makes sure that the duplicate registration fails by basically repeating that registration. Since the first one registered the user with the same name, the second one should clearly fail as a duplicate. You see the problem here. The second test depends on the first one to register that user. As long as the first method runs before the second method, everything is fine. But if you run them in reverse order, the second test fails because that user isn't registered yet, right? House of cards. If one falls, the rest could topple. Let's fix this. We make each test do everything it needs to do to get it to work. When we write a test case, we pretend that that's the only test in existence. None of the other tests even matter, which means that the tests should do all of the prerequisites necessary to initialize the conditions for that test. And after the test is done, it should actually clean up anything that it's done so that it doesn't unknowingly leave something in the database that's necessary for some other test to run and pass. All right. So every test needs to do its own setup and its own cleanup. We have learned the mechanism for doing this. We saw this before with the before each annotation and the after each annotation. Well, this step uses the same annotations too, but it tells you how you should use them to ensure that this principle of keeping tests independent and not dependent on something else to run. Here is a setup method where I'm clearing out all users and in the test user registration, I'm creating the user, registering it and validating that it works fine. And in the duplicate registration, what am I doing? I'm not expecting that the user was registered before. I registered the user twice because guess what? The database is cleared. I register the user twice and I expect that the second registration is what throws an exception. By using the before each annotation to reset the state before each test, we ensure independence. Now, no matter which order the tests are running, they won't affect each other. It's like giving each test its own sandbox to play in, right? So keep your tests independent and repeatable. This way you can run them in any order, any number of times and expect the same result. You avoid headaches and you build a robust, reliable test suite that serves its purpose. Moving on to the next step, sync like a QA engineer. When we write tests, the most basic and obvious thing that you want to do is make sure that the logic that you've coded works fine, right? Simplistic example, you have an add method that adds two numbers. How do you test it? Well, you give it the two numbers and you assert that the sum is correct. What we do as developers is write tests that are dependent on the code that's being written, right? We write tests knowing what works in the code. So we write tests that will pass considering the state of the code. My suggestion is when you're writing code, think like a QA engineer and write test code independent of whatever code it is that you have written, right? How does a traditional QA engineer do their work? I'm uh, reminded of this joke, right? A QA engineer walks into a bar, orders a beer, orders zero beers, orders this huge number of beers, orders a lizard, orders minus one beer, orders this alphanumeric number of beers. You get the idea. When you're writing test code, do this. It doesn't matter if some of these don't apply to your code in its current state. It doesn't matter. What's happening inside your code doesn't matter. It's almost like you think of your code in terms of its contract. What is the method under test supposed to do? What are its input arguments? What are its output? Think at that contract level and then throw edge cases at it, right? This is the advantage of test driven development after all. What's the best way to ensure that your tests aren't influenced by your code? We'll just write the tests first. Let's take the simple example of code that checks if a number is positive, right? It's this positive method returns number greater than zero. Then testing this, our first inclination is to just validate the happy path, right? Pass in a positive number and assert that it returns true. This tests the most basic case but it doesn't think about edge cases. Rewriting this test, thinking like a QA engineer, you would do a bunch more things. You would pass in zero, you would pass in minus one, you would pass in a huge value, a small value, right? We are testing for integer overflow. This helps validate 
the robustness of your code under different conditions. This is, of course, a very simplistic example. In the real world, actually, finding edge cases itself can be tricky, right? The edge cases we test for should be driven by the business logic and the requirements around the code. Take the example of testing login logic, right? Some edge cases would be testing with a valid username and password, testing with invalid credentials, testing with an empty password, testing with special characters in the username. So the exact edge case depends on what conditions are outlined in the business requirements. So for example, if special characters are allowed in the username, then that becomes a happy path check and not an edge case, right? But if they're restricted, testing for that edge case becomes critical. The point is edge cases reveal gaps between your code logic and your business rules. You have to ensure that your tests verify that that gap isn't there. And more importantly, that that gap continues to not be there with future changes to your code. So think like a QA person, go beyond the happy path, throw all sorts of data at your tests, right? Valid, invalid, edge cases, weird formats, strings, empty values, huge values, nulls, whatever you can think of, right? Make your code prove that it can handle it all, right? So this style of testing will reveal gaps that you didn't even know existed, right? And your code will be solid as a rock. All right, we are cruising along with these steps. Next up is tip number four, implement code coverage goals. What do I mean by code coverage? Simply put, it's a measure of what percentage of your code is exercised by your tests. When you run your tests that in turn run your code, what percentage of the actual code is run by your tests? If you write tests that don't execute your application code at all, even if you have hundreds and hundreds of tests, no application code is being called, so the coverage is 0%. On the other hand, 100% coverage means your tests touch and execute every single line of your application code, right? 50% means half of your code is not tested. We get the idea. So code coverage gives you an objective way to answer the question, how thoroughly am I testing my code? But there is a catch here. I'll come to that in a bit. In general, you will know how thoroughly you're testing your code because simply having a large number of tests doesn't cut it, right? You can have 100 mediocre tests that may only cover like 20% of your code. So tracking coverage makes sure that you kind of illuminate all the dark corners of your code, making sure that everything is running and verified. Now, how do you actually measure coverage? There are some great open source tools out there like like Jacoco and Kubertura, you can kind of integrate them into your build process and it auto generates coverage reports. These reports will show you exactly which lines are being executed in your test and which ones are not. Then you can use this data to strategically add more tests targeting those untouched areas. Now there is one big gotcha with code coverage that I need to call out. It only measures code execution and not assertions. You could have test that executes 90% of a class, but it doesn't actually validate anything after the code is run. So you run your test, your coverage report will read 90% and the test will always pass because you aren't testing anything, okay? The key point is that coverage analyzes how much code is run during tests, but not how well it is tested. So don't fall into the trap of chasing coverage metrics without actually asserting or validating your code's behavior. When you're writing tests, make sure to assert frequently, check expectations frequently, validate outputs, state changes and exceptions. The bottom line is use coverage data to improve your tests, but don't just fixate on that number alone because 100% coverage is not really useful anyway. Secondly, writing robust asserts is just as important as executing more code paths, right? So use coverage wisely to guide you, but don't let it lead you astray, all right? Next up in number five, leverage parameterized tests for data-driven testing. What do I mean by parameterized tests? Well, sometimes you need to test the same logic, but for different inputs and data. For example, testing a function that calculates discounts, you wanna try different amounts, right? Or validating a registration form, you're testing different user inputs, like valid and invalid usernames. You could copy paste the test methods or the test lines and modify the values, but that's messy. Parameterized tests allow you to write a test once and then feed it different data. JUnit has features that allow you to define like a list of values and JUnit will send it as arguments to your test code. Each time you will receive an argument and run the test with it and assert. And you do this without having to duplicate any test code, right? It makes it very clean, very concise and reusable. Here's a quick example to show you the syntax. Here I have the parameterized test annotation and have a value source annotation that provides a list of values. And JUnit is going to execute this unit test by passing in those values one by one to the number argument. The value source annotation allows you to specify like a collection 
collection of values that will be passed as the number parameter, right? Behind the scenes, JUnit will run this test four times, right? Once for each value. You can also specify custom data sources, maybe read test data from a CSV file. You're not limited to primitive types either. You can pass complex objects as uh, parameters. The key benefit is that you reduce repetitive code, right? You don't want to be doing copy pasting of code, right? So leveraging parameterized tests and uh, cleaning up your tests, which kind of doing the same thing over and over again, there's a huge win. You can run the tests with different data values. You can use this to try out all the edge cases that we learned in the previous step, right? You can validate your code's robustness against different inputs, thinking like a QA, so it makes it super useful. So here are my five tips to help you level up your JUnit skills. We covered writing focus tests, we covered consolidating setup logic, we covered thinking like a QA when you're writing tests, code coverage goals, and parameterized tests. Put these into practice and you're going to be on your way to becoming a JUnit testing pro. And before you know it, you're going to be looking forward to writing tests instead of pushing them away. You can treat writing tests as an opportunity to showcase your craftsmanship and who knows, you may even grow to enjoy writing tests. So try out these steps and let me know which one works best for you. And if you like this video, you're going to want to watch this one.